Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz on the show tonight. We check in with Chicago's top doc with Illinois' COVID cases climbing again, the new variant being in the U.S., and the beginning of holiday travel. The future of Chicago's ward map may now head to voters. We share the latest in the remap battle saga. We don't want to keep hearing our clients talk about the same thing again and again if we can address the issue. Tackling mental health within the LGBTQ community. That and more in a live report from Andersonville. Addressing maternal mortality is the focus of the so-called Momnibus legislative package. What this first signed bill means for some military moms. I'm concerned now about foreclosures, of course. Renters had a chance to receive government assistance, but what about homeowners? Good snap, good hold, good kick, goodbye. And after ending a five-game losing streak against the winless Detroit, the Bears face a tougher test against the 9-2 and two Cardinals. Brian is in Paris, as you mentioned. I'm in Andersonville as part of our Chicago Tonight in Your Neighborhood series located in the Edgewater community on Chicago's north side. Andersonville has one of the most concentrated areas of Swedish heritage as well as a large population of LGBTQ plus community. Now we'll learn about the rich history as well as how this neighborhood is adapting to eco-friendly initiatives. But first, I send it back to you. Thanks, Joanna. We'll see you soon. And now to some of today's top stories. Illinois logged more than 11,000 new coronavirus cases today. That's the most cases recorded in a 24-hour period since December 2020. Public health officials also reported 40 deaths. The seven-day statewide positivity rate is at 5.7 percent. Now, this comes as the U.S. identifies several cases of the Omicron variant of the coronavirus, though it hasn't yet been found in Illinois. Governor Pritzker spoke of the rise in hospitalizations at an unrelated news conference today. What we do know is that the increase in hospitalizations that we've seen, and again, we don't know yet whether Omicron is in Illinois. We know it's in the United States, so it's probably in the state of Illinois already. And again, we're testing for that. But what we've seen is that uh, hospitalizations are going up, uh, and there hasn't been a uh, worse uh, level of sickness anyway so far among those hospitalizations. It's just mostly unvaccinated people. And we will speak with Chicago Public Health Commissioner Dr. Allison Arwady in just a moment. Meanwhile, Americans will be reimbursed for over-the-counter COVID-19 tests this winter. The Biden administration announced this today along with other coronavirus mitigation efforts as the country heads into its second pandemic winter. Those with private insurance will be able to be reimbursed by their insurance company. Those not covered by private health plans will be able to access free at-home tests at community sites like health centers. All inbound international travelers, passengers, will need to test for COVID-19 within 24 hours of departure, no matter their vaccination status. The president also extended the mask mandate on all domestic flights and public transportation until the middle of March. Now, as we move into the winter and face the challenges of this new variant, this is a moment we can put the devices behind us, I hope. This is a moment we can do what we haven't been able to do enough of through this whole pandemic, get the nation to come together, unite the nation in a common purpose to fight this virus, to protect one another, to protect our economic recovery. And 15 older people are pushing for a voter referendum on Chicago's ward map. The group of city council members filed the map created by the Chicago Latino Caucus with the city clerk's office today. This comes a day after the council's rules committee released its draft of the map, which did not meet the Latino Caucus's demands. The move means voters will be asked to decide what the ward map should look like this June unless 41 older people can come to an agreement before May 19th. We'll have more on this story coming up later in the program. Up next, today's COVID surge. Stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols. The Jim and Kay Maybe family. The Polk Brothers Foundation and the support of these donors.
Illinois public health officials are reporting more than 11,000 new COVID cases for the first time since December 2020, and that's when vaccines were not widely available. The spike in cases comes amid concerns of the Omicron variant, which has not yet been detected in Illinois. So how will all of this factor into COVID guidance from the city and recommendations for holiday travel? Joining us now with more is Dr. Allison Arwady, Commissioner of Chicago's Department of Public Health. Dr. Arwady, thanks for being here as always. So this 11,000 plus caseload today, largest in about a year, is this a post Thanksgiving bump? It's certainly part of it is a post Thanksgiving bump. Uh, as you know, we've been on an increase with cases here for a number of weeks, uh, but yes, across the state and here in Chicago, we saw numbers of cases being reported that were higher than we've seen since last December to January. Uh, some of that is certainly the results of people gathering and traveling over Thanksgiving. Some of that is still, unfortunately, though, being driven by people who aren't vaccinated yet uh, and were exposed over the holiday. And when you see this bump, does it call for a discussion on potentially harsher mitigation measures again, like capacity limits or even shutdowns? Yeah, that's certainly not what we're talking about right now. Um, obviously, we're watching for Omicron closely and really wanting to learn a lot over the next couple of weeks about uh, how concerned we need to be about that particular variant. But I'm worried enough about Delta here right now. We're not at a point which is different than a year ago when we didn't have a vaccine. Uh, I still, you know, here in Chicago, almost 99% of the more than 6,500 deaths that we've had from COVID have been in people who are unvaccinated vaccinated and the fact that we can use vaccine and importantly boosters to help keep people out of the hospital and I do expect with some of these new oral medications those have the potential to be a big deal to also help people if they do get infected uh, stay out of the hospital so we're not looking at uh, more shutdowns right now we're certainly monitoring closely and really watching hospital capacity especially so it's a large number but the test positivity rate is a little bit over five that's been much higher than that in the past with a 58 percent of the population vaccinated do you anticipate that positivity rate to go up more I think it might. Uh, positivity is mostly, to my mind, about are you testing enough? Uh, here in the city of Chicago, we're still holding under that 5%. We're at about 3.7. And then, as you say, across the state, 5 to 6. We want to see it stay under 5%. Mostly that tells us we're testing enough to really be able to detect uh, the surges. And so when we see it go over 5, for me, that's an indication that you've got to step up some additional testing. Uh, and I think, uh, as a reminder, the positivity is literally the percent of all of the tests that you're doing that are testing positive. So the combination of an increase in cases and an increase in positivity tells us that this is not just an artifact related to testing over Thanksgiving. Uh, this is unfortunately a continued increased uh, surge. Speaking of testing, President Biden today outlined his winter strategy. Part of that is free at home testing. As you know, it's sometimes been hard to come by in Chicago. Aldermanic offices have run out of those at home tests. Is there a plan to replenish those uh, so residents can get access to that pretty easily? Yeah, so I'm really pleased by that move by the federal government today. I love the at-home tests. I keep them at home. I order them on, you know, online or I pick them up at a pharmacy. So I always have them available. So you can just do the rapid at home. Uh, if anybody's got a cold, if you're going to be seeing somebody with an underlying condition. And uh, right now you can buy two for about $23, $24. But we know that there are people for whom that is not accessible. In Chicago, uh, as you noted, we did distribute them to aldermanic offices in advance of the Thanksgiving holiday. We also are door-to-door -door work in a lot of the hardest hit neighborhoods or some of the lowest income neighborhoods. We've certainly been distributing them. But I think the uh, the work to really bring the cost down there, uh, have insurance cover it, make it more available, and importantly, increase the supply. It's kind of like vaccine early on. Even when Chicago, uh, the health department tries to order additional at-home tests, it takes usually weeks at this point to get it. So I'm really pleased by doubling down on that. I think it's gonna be an important part of our strategy um, along with some of these new oral medications moving forward. The president also announced doubling down on testing for those who are traveling, especially by air. Is that going to help keep these numbers down? Um, I think any testing 
can help. Uh, really though, what I always remind people is that testing is just detecting people who are already infected with COVID. The most important thing is continuing to push on vaccine. And honestly, where international travel is typically requiring uh, proof of vaccination, that to me is even more important. The test is another piece that helps with that. Uh, and certainly we want to detect people. Um, and if, if the idea of testing before you travel helps limit the risk that you would then bring, that you often are in contact with a lot of folks uh, who you would not normally be during travel. So I'm in support of increased um, testing, of course, but always really the answer here is still vaccine uh, and then getting boosters for people who are six months post Moderna or Pfizer or two months post J&J. &J. Talk about further restrictions not being discussed right now. You have cities like New York who have imposed uh, mandatory vaccination status if you want to go to restaurants or clubs mm -hmm. or things like that. Is that something that the, that the mayor's administration is discussing here in Chicago? Because it's still not yeah. the case quite yet. That's right. Yes. No, of course we are. And I think when I think about any restriction type setting, it's more anything that's um, encouraging vaccination would be more than trying to do the capacity limits. We don't want to have to shut things down. Uh, we've seen many, many settings here in Chicago, as you know, voluntarily do this. So really all of the theaters, the music venues are doing this. Uh, really many, many large gatherings, especially with this surge, we've been very strongly encouraging a vaccine requirement, if not a vaccine requirement, at least a vaccine or a recent negative test. Uh, and I think that actually is a good strategy to continue double down, doubling down on. We've not made it a requirement uh, broadly outside of larger events, et cetera, at this point. Um, but that would certainly be the sort of thing we would consider before doing capacity limits and things like that. Again, watching a little bit what's happening with the bear. All right. So, that's what I'm thinking right so now. perhaps that's on the table. And uh, with the holidays coming, what's your advice for families who are looking to travel and gather? Yeah. So it's it's really not different at this point from what it was for thanksgiving the safest thing is to be gathering with people who are as vaccinated as they can be for their age so that means uh kids five and up really by the holiday season at the end of december will have the opportunity to have been fully vaccinated for the younger kids i'm comfortable gathering with them as long as their parents and relatives have been doing it and if people are going to be gathering who are not fully vaccinated uh it's critical that testing is a part of that i would really be encouraging uh any gathering where everybody's not vaccinated to just be doing that home test that morning and honestly for an extra set of protection if we are having a little more trouble with the, with the variant by that point which we very well may be uh, we may want even more testing in that setting we don't want people worrying about covid we don't want it really overlaying their holiday seasons and i think as long as people continue to do the things that have gotten us this far get yourself boosted ahead of the holiday is sort of that last piece of advice um, so that we're all as protected as we can be and this doesn't have to be another holiday season that, that is completely off the rails because of COVID. Those boosters are widely available at this point. Uh, Dr. Ardy, while I have you, I have to ask you about this other item in the news. Uh, uh, activists from the Southeast side are calling on you and the Department of Public Health to deny a permit for a metal shredding facility in that community for, uh, for the company Reserve Management Group. Do you have a position yet on that permit? So we are in the middle of a health impact assessment, which the U.S. Uh, Environmental Protection Agency has asked us to do. We've been gathering additional information, working with the scientists at the EPA, collecting community input. Uh, there's another meeting that's happening next week, and we are still very much in the middle of this process. I appreciate everybody who has been weighing in on that, but we have to finish the process of the assessment. There's a formal uh, process that goes along with that, and then, of course, a decision will be made. All right, Dr. Allison Arwadi, thank you so much for joining us, as always. Thank you. And now, Brandis, we toss it back to you. Paris, thank you. Nestled in Chicago's Edgewater community on the north side, Andersonville is known for its vibrant Clark Street corridor filled with a diverse selection of businesses and restaurants. Joanna Hernandez and producer Acacia Hernandez spent the day there as part of our Chicago Tonight in Your Neighborhood series. And Joanna joins us now with more. Hey, Joanna. 
Hey, Brandis, I don't know if you know this, but Andersonville was named the second coolest neighborhood in the country by Time Out Chicago. This area has a reputation of feeling like a small, small town in a big city filled with local businesses. But we have to start by talking about the Swedish roots and what better way to do that than heading to the Swedish Museum. Now, this institution has been a staple in the community since 1946. And if you want to learn more about the history of Sweden's migrating to the neighborhood after the great Chicago Fire, this is a place to start. I think what's so special about this museum is that it really talks about immigration. Obviously, all of our objects are Swedish or Scandinavian because it is the Swedish American Museum, but it honors and it highlights immigration for everyone about what, what the hardship is to move from one country to another. Karen Moen Abercrombie has worked at the Swedish American Museum for the last 15 years. She says Andersonville feels very much like walking down a street in Sweden. Now, even though the neighborhood has changed over the years as new groups and cultures started to move into the area, Abercrombie says Swedish roots will continue to live on for years to come. And even though you have businesses in the area that really have nothing Connect, directly connected to Sweden. They have a Swedish flag in there, or they like what the chamber is doing by connecting in the Swedish language a little bit in our neighborhood guide, in the traditions that we're all celebrating together. And around the 80s, the area started to see a large LGBTQ population move in, and we can still see that today. The Chicago Therapy Collective works to push inclusivity and diversity here. They are a non profit organization focusing on mental health for the LGBTQ+, especially the trans community. One of the programs they run is Hire Trans Now. This initiative works not only with these local businesses, but across the city, addressing disparities in, way, in ways businesses can be more inclusive to everyone. Um, just the experience of walking in a business uh, before coming to therapy and getting either misgendered or gendered correctly can impact somebody's mood for like the next few hours. I would say that those kinds of microaggressions around gendering are so, so, so big. And so we tell our, our businesses to make sure to gender folks neutrally when they come in the door or read them correctly if they're giving you some clear signs. The neighborhood is also big on taking on eco-friendly initiatives. The Chamber of Commerce has worked with the neighborhood to make recycling a priority and most recently recruited shops and restaurants to participate with Waste Not Compost, a pilot program encouraging businesses to learn how to compost. We started with Waste Not Compost, a composting program where you have 20 plus businesses, restaurants, health and wellness and services who compost within their business. And we're hoping to add about 20 more in the beginning of 2022. And this bustling urban neighborhood is home to a diverse selection of restaurants on Clark Street, including Middle Eastern products and cuisine. We stopped by Middle Eastern Bakery and Groceries, which has been in the neighborhood since 1982. That is a long time. The owner was in his early 20s when he opened his business during a time, he says, when a big population of people from Iraq lived in the area and brought in a selection of Middle Eastern products to the neighborhood. Always we have something different. We always we have something new. We have something like the buys we make. We have always we come with something. The deli we always come with something. Now we have like like 14 different kind of hummus, and everything made from fresh, from fresh daily. And you can't walk down the street with noticing all the antique shop, the cafes, the businesses, and all these cool furniture stores. A popular commercial strip if you're trying to find something unique and handmade. The Chicago Fair Trade Pop-Up, an organization focused on environmental sustainability, has also returned to the neighborhood where dozens of vendors around the country sell handmade products, including Renew. So all of our products are made by refugee women who are relocated in DuPage County. We um, use donated textiles, so everything's one of a kind, um, and they're all handmade. And I had a chance to check out the pop-up right behind me, and I have to tell you, it's worth going in. I bought these amazing smelling candles. And coming up, we're actually speaking with the director about the pop-up and learning more about fair trade. But first, we send it back to you. Looking forward to that, Joanna. Thank you. And now to Paris and where the city's ward remap process stands. Paris. 
Thanks, Brandis. For the first time in 30 years, Chicago voters might have a say in what the city's ward map will look like. That is, if members of city council can't agree on a version by spring. WTTW News reporter Heather Sharon joins us now with the latest chapter in this ongoing remap saga. So, as we heard earlier today, Heather, the Latino caucus moved to force a referendum on ward maps. Uh, fill us in here. Well, it really ratchets up the tension between the Black Caucus and the Latino Caucus in this fight over the map, which will shape politics in Chicago for the next decade and really determine the balance of power on the city council between Black aldermen, Latino aldermen, and potentially even an Asian alderman representing a newly created ward with a majority of Asian American voters. Uh, this, what happened today doesn't make a referendum certain, but it certainly moves us one step closer to what everybody at City Hall has been calling the nuclear option. So if City Council does not get 41 votes by late spring, Heather, uh, then there will be a referendum, So, but there's still a long way to go here. And briefly, Black Caucus, Latino Caucus, what is each caucus fighting for in their version of the map? Well, it all comes down to the number of wards controlled by the majority of black voters or Latino voters. The Black Caucus map would create 14 wards with a majority of Latino voters, but the Latino Caucus says they will not settle for anything less than the 15 wards of majority Latino voters that its map creates. And it's a zero sum game. Either there's 14 Latino wards or there's 15 Latino wards, and that's going to come at the expense of the Black Caucus, which is struggling to hang on to political power in a, ch in a city that is seeing its demographics change significantly. A lot more negotiating to go here and recap for us how the city got to this point. Well, every 10 years, the results of the census require the city to redraw its, ma its ward map, and this year, that means that politicians are having to grapple with the fact that, as I said, Chicago's black population is dropping nearly 10% in the past decade, while the city's Latino population has jumped 5%, while the Asian population in Chicago has soared 30%. It's a very different city, and people are really grappling with how to re best represent that at City Hall. And very quickly, Heather, that people's map drawn by the independent advisory referendum group, uh, we had Madeline Dubeck on who's leading that. Is that getting any traction at all or still zero alder people in favor of that one? Zero alder people. They need 10 aldermen to walk into the city clerk's office and support that map and put it on the referendum ballot if there is one. Uh, today, the Latino caucus had 15 aldermen, so... Uh, they got to find those supporters somewhere, but it doesn't seem likely at this point. And 41, as we said, is the magic number. All right. Heather, thanks very much. Thanks, Paris. And you can read Heather's full story on our website. That's WTTW.com slash news. And up next, what a delay in mortgage relief could mean for some homeowners. So stay with us. Spend Saturday evening with the Voices of Chicago. Latino Voices at 6 and Black Voices at 6.30. See you on Saturdays. Illinois has dispersed $750 million to help those who fell behind on rent during the coronavirus pandemic, with more assistance on the way. Far less, though, has gone to homeowners having trouble keeping up with their bills. And it may be months before homeowners see any relief. Amanda Venicky joins us now to look at why and what beleaguered homeowners can do in the meantime. Amanda. Yeah, Brandis, an eviction moratorium and other pandemic cushions helped keep tenants and homeowners alike have roof over the roofs over their heads, but the moratorium no longer in place and legal proceedings that had been on pause during much of the pandemic now going forward. Housing attorney Carla Krobach is now concerned about an increase in foreclosures. So we have lots of people who were you know, got behind in March 2020 and are now in facing foreclosure because they've gone this whole time without any kind of additional protection except for eviction from their homes. She says she's getting calls from desperate homeowners who are really frustrated wanting assistance. We talked to a client just yesterday as well who had lost her 35-year-old daughter to COVID. And this daughter was a major contributor to the household. 
mom, the client was already older, living on social security. Without that money, she's not going to be able to keep up with her mortgage. Now, early in the pandemic, Illinois, it did help out 10,000 homeowners who had fallen behind on their mortgages. But that, again, back in 2020, this year is set to come to a close without any money for mortgage assistance. There is $250 million allotted for that very cause. But Illinois still waiting on federal government approval before that money can be sent out. And that is taking time. Head of the Illinois Housing Development Authority, Kristen Faust, says she'd love to be getting those dollars flowing now. Instead, she expects it will not happen until spring. We are in a judicial foreclosure state in Illinois. The foreclosures don't happen rapidly when it's your own home. This is all about owner-occupied homes. And so we believe that the timing will be, will work for most all um, homeowners. I'm, I'm sure not, I'm sure there'll be exceptions, but we do think that this timing will work. Krobach though, isn't so sure. The lag time is certainly significant and may lead to this kind of influx of foreclosures that I am so, so nervous about. Is that going to happen before a judge orders a sale of the home? Do we have to wait until the sheriff is at the door, at which point it's far too late? Both she and Faust say it makes sense that the early focus was on renters. They have fewer protections and the foreclosure process more lengthy, so there's more time. Also, some homeowners, say those who have two flats and rent part of it, were helped out if their tenants qualified for rental assistance. Now, both women also stress that there are actions that distressed homeowners can take and they should do so right away. Call your mortgage servicer. That's, that's pe most people get something in the mail or something by email about their mortgage payment. The phone number will be right on there and call them and talk to them about the fact that you're having trouble making your payment and have that conversation. She says many servicers are really willing to work with borrowers. She believes that lessons were learned since that 2008 housing crisis and many servicers are amenable to working out a plan, something like forbearance. Now, if you are not comfortable calling your mortgage provider, there are free, skilled, HUD certified counseling agencies that can help. And you can find a list at IllinoisHousingHelp.org. They understand how to work with the servicer. And I would really encourage people to reach out to those um, housing counseling agencies now. Don't wait until the end. Don't wait until foreclosure has been filed. Don't wait until you have a date. The sooner you reach out to your servicer or to the housing counseling agency, the more likely you are to have a really positive resolution. Once that mortgage assistance is available, again, thinking spring, approximately 12,000 Illinois households will be eligible for up to $30,000 of mortgage assistance each. Struggling renters do not need to wait. Illinois and Chicago are each up opening up a new round of rental assistance on Monday. Now to be eligible, tenants have to be within about 80% of their area's median income, and then also at least a month behind on rent to receive up to $2,500 in rental assistance. And now Brandis, back to you. Amanda, thank you. And now Paris, we toss it back to you. Thanks, Brandis. And still to come on Chicago tonight, President Biden signs a bill aimed at helping black veteran mothers. We speak with one of the main champions of that piece of legislation. <laughs> a fair trade pop-up brings products from over 30 countries to Andersonville. We'll hear from its director who's been busy preparing for the holiday season. And after ending a five-game losing streak against the toothless Detroit Lions, the Bears face a much tougher test at home against the Cardinals on Sunday. But first, some more of today's top stories. Former President Barack Obama visits youth at Southside YMCA. He and his wife Michelle are in Chicago to meet with young community leaders and talk about addressing a range of issues from mental health and food insecurity to violence and LGBTQ advocacy. They'll be in town through tomorrow. 
Illinois child care providers are set to receive additional pandemic relief from the state. Governor J.B. Pritzker announced another round of financial relief for licensed child care providers in Illinois. This latest round of assistance will amount to $300 million. This brings the state's child care pandemic relief grant total to more than $1 billion. More than 5,000 providers in Illinois have benefited from these grants so far. Supporting this sector is one of the best investments that we can make as a state. Working families need child care. Businesses need workers. Today we're making it more affordable for Illinois families, helping parents, especially mothers, go back to work and bolstering providers' ability to have a full payroll of well-trained child care workers. And Governor Pritzker also attended the Gold Star Family Tree Lighting Ceremony at the Thompson Center. The tree honors more than 260 Illinois service members who have died since September 11, 2001, and their families. Some Gold Star families attended the ceremony in person, while others attended remotely. What better symbol of these men and women than lights for each of their service members? They went into a dark place in the world and offered hope. They lit a candle for freedom. And while these warriors gave their lives, their light lives on in their families, in their communities, in this state, and across our nation. A travel site is recognizing a Chicago holiday tradition. Big Seven Travel released its list for the best 25 markets in the U.S. for 2021 and Chris Kindle Market is number one. The German Christmas market features live music, shopping, and many food and drink options like spiced wine and stuffed gourmet pretzels. The market has two locations again this year, one in the Loop and the other right next to Wrigley Field in Wrigleyville. Last year, the market was virtual because of the pandemic. And now back to Brandis with a local congresswoman for details on a bill signed into law this week. Brandis. In Paris, moms who've served in the military are now getting extra support from Washington. President Joe Biden this week signed the Protecting Moms Who Served Act, championed by Illinois Congresswoman Lauren Underwood and Senator Tammy Duckworth. The bill is the first of 12 in the Black Maternal Health Momnibus package intended to eliminate maternal mortality in the United States. Joining us now with more is Illinois Congresswoman Lauren Underwood, a Democrat from, from Naperville. Congresswoman, thank you for joining us again and welcome back. So first, if you would, tell us what this first bill does for women veterans. So the Protecting Moms Who Served Act is legislation that gives the VA additional tools to make sure that they are offering the world-class care that our veteran moms have earned. Listen, we know that women are the fastest growing segment of our veteran population. And right now, there's over half a million women veterans under 40. And because of their service, Many of these women veterans are at increased risk for maternal mortality, so dying from a pregnancy-related complication or severe morbidity, right? Really complicated deliveries and postpartum periods. And so with this legislation, we have funding and that we are codifying existing VA programs to make sure that the VA will always provide this high quality care to avoid that maternal death and severe complications as a result of pregnancies. And you just touched on it, but what are some of the unique needs uh, faced by women who've served and moms who are serving? So we know that as a result of some of the stress, some of the injuries and some of the exposures uh, that our women veterans uh, experience while service members, that they are at increased risk for some of the leading causes of maternal death in this country. And so right now within the VA system, um, most veteran moms are not delivering their babies at the VA, right? They're getting care in the community, but that care is coordinated through the VA. And so there's opportunities to increase the quality of that care coordination um, and to quite frankly, make sure that the VA is very well resourced in every single VA region in this country, which our women veterans know is not always the case for gender specific or women specific healthcare. There's a lot of volatility and it, it's just, not consistently high quality everywhere you go in the country. And this is an area that we can improve. Why? Because in 2021, we believe that we shouldn't have 
birthing people die just because they're delivering babies and giving birth and having pregnancy related complications. That's unacceptable. And so as a federally run healthcare system, right, which is the, what the VA is, we have an opportunity as members of Congress to help strengthen the quality of care that these moms receive. Now, this bill, it's the first of 12 in the so-called Momnibus uh, package. The others are all part of the Build Back Better Infrastructure Act. Um, tell us about these other measures that are still in the larger bill. So in the United States, we know that black birthing people are three to four times more likely to die of pregnancy-related complications than their white counterparts. And so in order to and our nation's maternal mortality crisis, we have to have a comprehensive approach. And that's what the Mommy Bus is. It allows us to invest in things like growing and diversifying our perinatal workforce, meaning that we can have more midwives, more nurse midwives, more lactation consultants, more doulas, so that every mom can have the support that she needs during pregnancy, labor and delivery, and the full year long postpartum period, um, but also that they can have choice. Um, and we know from the literature, from the data, that when a, a pregnant person has the opportunity to select their provider, uh, that there are better outcomes. Uh, we also are investing in uh, things like maternal mental health and substance use treatment. Uh, we are investing in social determinants of health, like housing and transportation and nutrition assistance. We're also investing in addressing this COVID-19 pandemic and its unique impacts on this population of moms. Um, and finally, addressing the impacts of extreme heat and air pollution, which we know these climate change related impacts are very harmful uh, to expectant moms, uh, postpartum moms and their infants. And so the National Institutes of Health re-examined death certificates related to maternal deaths from 2016 to 2017, uh, and they found that black women were 3.5 times more likely to die than white women. Now, that's different because previous studies had indicated that the death rate was only 2.5 times higher for black women than white women. Uh, what does this disparity tell you about, you know, our research and our knowledge of the problem that we have with maternal mortality? That's right. So there's a lot of room for cleaning up these data sources, standardizing the reporting from every state and making sure uh, that we have a complete and accurate grasp of the scope of the problem, which is why within the Mommy Bus, we have the Data to Save Moms Act. And what's so important to remember, Brandis, is when we talk about the Build Back Better Act and these investments, they are paid for by making sure that the corporate tax evaders and the wealthiest Americans are paying their fair share. That's how we're able to fund these important initiatives like the mommy bus. Now, we also know, though, that as you've mentioned, the, the, those 11 other measures, they're still in the Build Back Better Act, which is facing some opposition, of course, from Senate Republicans, a little bit of pushback from a couple of Democrats as well. What needs to happen to get that legislation passed? Well, what needs to happen is that they need to decide to work on it. Right now, the Senate hasn't even taken up the Build Back Better Act, and so we are waiting. Moms around America can't wait for the Senate to just get around to doing this work. Um, and so when we talk about Build Back Better, I share a real sense of urgency around the need to address our nation's maternal mortality crisis. And I am calling upon the Senate to take up this legislation immediately. They can pass it by Christmas. And how wonderful of a gift it would be to American families around the country to see this legislation signed into law. And Congresswoman, while we've got you, you know, some Senate Republicans are also threatening to block the continuing resolution that would fund the government uh, over the president's vaccine mandate for employers. Obviously, the hope here is to avoid a government shutdown. Are you frustrated that the vaccine mandate has become a political football? You know, I think that we have had a long time to tackle this issue of funding government. The idea of shutting down the federal government and putting at risk uh, benefits that hard earning American or, or everyday Americans are counting on to survive, particularly in these winter months, is just reckless. And so, you know, I am hopeful that these Senate Republicans can air their grievances, that they can have a thorough debate, but that people will be committed to funding this continuing resolution by midnight tomorrow. Okay, and of course, with newly drawn uh, statewide districts, the next election for you uh, could look different. We look forward to talking to you more about that next time we see you. Congresswoman Lauren Underwood, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And now to Joanna, who spent the day in Andersonville as part of our In Your Neighborhood series. Joanna. Now, thanks, Brandis. We're now here with the alderman of the 48th Ward, Harry Osterman. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks for being out here. So we got to start off with COVID. 
So we all know it's hit communities very hard, especially small businesses. Can you tell me a little bit about the economic recovery at this point here in the neighborhood? So first, when COVID hit Chicago and it hit the world, um, the businesses in the community really rallied together. So we raised money to help people that needed food. Um, we helped support the local businesses. So I think one of the great parts about Andersonville is it's a lot of local small businesses and um, residents in the community really went out of their way to support the businesses to keep them open. So we have not seen a lot of businesses closed. As we get into the holiday season, we're really looking for a robust recovery where people are uh, spending their money locally. Uh, tomorrow night, we have a thing called Late Night Andersonville where the businesses will be open later. So it's a great time to visit Andersonville and really support the, the small businesses. And we've done that through COVID and we're really looking for a good uh, economic bounce in the, in the weeks and months ahead and it seems like you're really encouraging people to shop local shop local get off the couch come out visit andersonville great restaurants great businesses great people uh, but in every part of chicago they, people should support their own local small businesses now the public safety is also something you've been pushing for since your re-election campaign has andersonville seen an uptick in crime like much of chicago andersonville we've been fortunate that um crime has not escalated but i think what i would say is that um public safety and crime in every corner of the city is the number one priority for all chicagoans so we're very vigilant here we work to make sure that it's safe um but i think everyone is concerned about safety across the city and i think all of us have to really work on that in a multitude of ways uh supporting uh hiring young people for jobs supporting people that have mental health issues um, really trying to support people. Um, it's been a really tough time for everyone with COVID and everything else. So um, we're really trying to look at it holistically. But um, knock on wood, the crime has not uh, escalated here. Now I want to change gears here. You also want banks the city does business with to do a better job of lending to black and Latino Chicagoans for home purchases and business no loans. What led to this initiative? So basically, there's been a long uh, negative history of um, redlining and other things where African American and Hispanics could not get loans and have been priced out of neighborhoods. Uh, we really want to make sure that banks that are doing business with the city of Chicago are lending in black and brown communities, really giving people a chance to have a home, to have the wealth that they can get for their family that comes from home ownership, and it really helps stabilize neighborhoods. Um, someone in North Lawndale should be able to get a loan just like someone in Andersonville. So the city of Chicago, um, members of all parts of the city council are really working on this issue. I think we're going to have a hearing in the finance committee next week about the next round of deposits. And these are banks that are doing business with the city, so we expect that they are going to be looking after and supporting um, residents of Chicago, but specifically those in communities that have been uh, neglected for many, many years. Now, there has, a big, there has been a big debate and negotiations that have been going on for Chicago's new ward map. You signed on the Black Caucus map. How come? Well, um, I, it's, it's a map that has been worked on through the Rules Committee that's supported by members of the Black Caucus, supported by aldermen from the north side, supported by some Latino representative aldermen. So we really look at it as it's a diverse coalition of people. And the reality is, is that we have been working for two months to draw these maps. So I think that the goal that all of us should have is to really resolve this issue uh, really sitting down. I think we have the opportunity to do that. Let's be real clear, though. Chicago, 2.7 million Chicagoans want us, their elected officials, to be focused on crime, supporting small business, creating affordable housing, not fighting about ward boundaries. So it's inherent on all the elected officials and city council members to really come together and work this out. Now, we don't have much time here, but I do need to ask, this is probably a question that many people are asking, the CTA Bergwin stomp on the red line, when can they expect construction to be finished? It's going to be a long time, about three years, but people People can get off at Bryn Mawr or Argyle to come to Andersonville, uh, but when it's done, it's going to blossom and be a part of our neighborhood. But please come up, visit the small business here in Andersonville. Well, thank you so much for joining us thank tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, stay with us. Coming up, we have the director of the pop-up, and we're learning more about the Chicago's fair trade. But first, I send it back to you. Thanks, Joanna. We'll see you soon. And up next, previewing the Bears-Cardinals matchup, but what will the weather be like on game day? Here's a look.
Looks like the drama out of Hallis Hall has died down this week with the Bears coming off a last second 16 to 14 victory over the winless Detroit Lions. But this Sunday, a much tougher opponent awaits with Super Bowl contending Arizona Cardinals. And joining us now with more is James Big Cat Williams, former offensive lineman for the Chicago Bears from 1991 to 2002. Big Cat, great to see you uh, as always. So the Bears end their five-game losing streak uh, on Thanksgiving with that thrilling uh, walk-off field goal. What did you make of their performance capping off a really strange week? Yeah, it was it was a long week. You have to you have to imagine for the coaches and for the players. You know, there were a lot of distractions up at House Hall that last week. And, you know, for them to pull out a win, no matter how ugly it was, it was still a win, and it was a win that they needed. Um, you know, not, not so much a win that they needed to try and save the coach's job or anything like that, but a win that they needed as a group, as a team, to say that, look, you know, let's go out here, play hard. We have a lot of things to play for. And, you know, you, you kind of take it personal and go out there and do, the, do as much as you can to get a win, you know, just to show yourselves that you can do it. And Justin Fields, no doubt, is the future uh, at the quarterback position. The organization considers him to be the, the burgeoning franchise quarterback. But is, uh, is he too injured to play this week? And if so, uh, how has Andy Dalton played in his stead? Uh, I think I think with when you're talking about a young quarterback like Fields, and you're talking about your future franchise, I think you have to be, you know, a little over cautious because you don't want him going out there and hurting himself further. He is a young guy. He has a lot of talent. There are a lot of things that he can do on the field, but you don't want him putting himself in harm's way uh, when he doesn't have to. You know, we want to see him grow. We want to see him progress as a young quarterback. But we also don't want to get him killed before his time comes comes to play. And there's been a lot of hard hits that he sustained uh, all season long. The Bears take on the 9-2 and two, uh, Arizona Cardinals, uh, tops uh, in the uh, NFC West. Kyler Murray, star quarterback, has been injured but supposed to be coming back. The Bears' defense has lots of injuries. How are they going to stop this uh, quarterback? Well, it's, it's, it's a guessing game right now because we don't know who's starting. If Kyler Murray starts, then you're talking about a quarterback that can hold on to the ball, push the ball down the field to some of those weapons they have, and make those big, exciting plays. If McCoy starts, now you're talking about a guy that is going to be a game manager for them. He's going to throw the short, quick passes. They're going to run the ball. They're going to run the screen plays. Uh, they're going to basically try and move the ball methodically up and down the field on the Bears and, you know, force the Bears to stop them. And, you know, it's, a, it's, it's going to be a question about how much pressure do the Bears try and put on them? Do they try and blitz them? Are they going to try and play press coverage because McCoy's in there? And, you know, they want to stop the short passes because he really has not shown that ability to throw the ball downfield. And the bright spot in the defense for the Bears has been the defensive lineman Robert Quinn, who was named uh, NFC Player of the Month, so maybe he can get some pressure on whoever the quarterback is. Uh, on the offensive side of the ball for the Bears, Allen Robinson still dinged up. Uh, do you see them being able to exploit uh, Arizona's defense, either in the run game or the passing game? Well, I think they definitely have to attempt to run the ball. Um, you know, the, I think the strength of the Arizona second, the Arizona defense is their secondary. Uh, they're, they're ball hawks. They, they get after people. They will press you at the line of scrimmage. And, you know, they're, they're able to generate pressure from that front seven. I think they are eighth in the league in sacks right now. So they have the ability to put pressure on you. They have the ability to shut your wide receivers down. Um, you know, running the ball is, I think, the most effective way to attack a team like Arizona. But you know, you have to you have to be able to you have to be able and you have to be willing to stick with it. I want to get back to the game in a second. There's a couple reports this week uh, predicting that perhaps one of the top receivers in the game, Devontae Adams, with the Packers, could land in free agency with the Bears next year. Do you think that's a possibility at all, given the fact that receivers? 
don't fare well in Chicago uh, over the last few decades? Uh, you'd have to, I, I mean, in my own personal opinion right now with the state of the Bears, you'd have to question whether a player of his magnitude would want to come here after seeing, you know, uh, Robinson the last couple of years, the way he's been handled uh, as far as the contract stuff and, you know, just their inability to get him the ball this year. You know, you, you knew coming into this year that Robinson was the number one wide receiver and they just have not made the attempts to get him the ball like a number one receiver. So, you know, that that, that would have to weigh heavy on my on my mind as far as if I was a receiver thinking about coming to the Bears. Yeah, it might be a tough sell uh, to get him to come to Chicago. All right, your prediction for this Sunday. I, I, I just don't, you know, you're talking about a 9-2 and two Arizona team. They've had a backup quarterback in for the last three weeks, and they've gone 2-1. and one. They've, you know, figured out how to work with what they've got, and I just don't see the Bears being strong enough with – all the injuries that you have on defense, the possibility of Fields not playing, Robinson not playing. I just can't see them pulling this one off. So I'm going 13-24 Arizona. All right. Well, but maybe the Bears can play spoiler at uh, four and seven. And as always, our I thanks to – yeah, uh, uh, as do I. Our thanks to James Big Cat Williams. Thanks so much. Thanks, Bears. And up next, we check back in with Joanna Hernandez, who's reporting live from Chicago's Andersonville neighborhood. But first, a look at some events happening this weekend. And now we check back in with Joanna, who spent the day in Andersonville as part of our In Your Neighborhood series. Joanna. Uh, thanks, Paris. We're now here with Catherine Vizzo Cordova, Executive Director for Chicago Fair Trade. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. Now, I want to start off, for those who aren't familiar with what fair trade is, how would you describe it? Sure. It's a business model and also a movement of uh, using business as a force for good. So when you buy something fair trade, that means that the person, the people who made it, often they're made by co-op, by people working in cooperatives that are paid a fair wage, um, have democratic work and safe workplaces, work in environmentally sound um, practices, um, environmental sustainability is a tenant. It means there's no child labor involved. It's basically following the golden rule uh, with business and just doing on to others as you would, uh, just doing, doing the right thing at every step. And where did the passion spark for you to start this? Well, I started working for Chicago Fair Trade. I was a business member of Chicago Fair Trade, then I was the board chair, and then I was hired as the executive director uh, in 2014. And I had worked for a fair trade business, and um, pop ups were becoming kind of popular. And we have a lot of small businesses where they can't be everywhere at one time. So we said, why well, don't I suggested we do a pop up? So, eight, this is our eighth annual. Uh, holiday pop-up shop and it's become my favorite part of my job. I love my job but I love November and December. <laughs> and what can people expect when they walk in? Um, I think people are often surprised it's a 6,000 square foot and people are like this is a pop-up we look like we're a permanent store we um, we take it very seriously right now we just transformed it into a winter wonderland and they can find uh, goods from 25 Chicago Fair Trade business members they're all locally owned businesses um, over 90 percent are women owned and they ha they work with uh, makers and farmers around the globe as well as there's some local social enterprises here and when you go in you can find really high quality beautiful handmade goods there's food products there's coffee there's chocolate there's olive oil there's slippers there's blankets there's ornaments there's clothing there's um, all sorts of items and how would you say that COVID impacted the businesses within the Chicago Fair Trade Coalition it, it impacted them a lot I mean there's still you know there's some supply chain issues people with containers that are stuck but they're very resilient it's a it's a not an easy the easiest way to do business um, fair trade so I find that it's a very resilient um, passionate, dedicated group. So I'm happy to say none of our members closed um, during COVID. We have, um, they're all going strong. A lot of them helped s raise money to send food and necessities during COVID, but now they're back to, you know, selling their products and uh, 
Yeah. And creating new products. Can you tell me a little bit about the hours? How long is sure. this pop-up going to be here? Sure. How can people come? Yeah. What? We're um, we open November 1st. We're open through December 24th. We're open from 11 to 7 every day. We're closed Mondays, but we'll be open the last Monday before Christmas. Um, so 11 to 7, 5228 North Clark Street. Look for the Akira awning, but it's Chicago <laughs> Fair Trade inside. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great night, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. All right, Paris, I heard you had a question for me. Well, Joanna, <laughs> you spent the day in the second hippest neighborhood in the world. What'd you take away? I mean, I don't live too far off. I grew up in Rogers Park, like I've mentioned before, and it really does feel super cool. Like, you walk around, everyone's super friendly, and it's very, you can feel the inclusivity and how everyone just wants to understand everyone. So I can definitely say, if you need to find something unique or cool for Christmas, because it's coming up, this is a place to shop. You also got and that, that is all we have here from Andersonville. I'm sorry, what did you say? I was going to say you can also get some glug at Simon's Tavern, so don't, don't miss that while you're out there. It's a it holiday is. tradition. It's right over there, actually. Right. All right. All right. Thanks, Joanna. That's so true. Well, that is all from us here. No problem. Take care. All right. And we're back to wrap things up right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. And that is our show for this Thursday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, WTTW.com slash news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night at 7 for the Week in Review. And we leave you tonight with some more from today's Gold Star Family Tree Lighting Ceremony at the Thompson Center. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy and safe, and we'll see you tomorrow. Possible in part by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices. Wishing all a happy and healthy holiday season.